Revelation chapter number 8. <clears throat> to refresh your memories, last week we finished those seven seals on the book that the Lamb was able to take out of the hand of God. He loosed that seventh seal <clears throat> in the beginning part of chapter number 8. It says that when that seventh seal was opened, that there was silence in heaven about space a half an hour. And I want you all to remember this week, one of those other seals was to roll back the sky to where men on earth would be able to see the very face of God. In fact, everyone on earth left, says all the kings and the mighty men and everybody else, they ran to the caves and the hills and the mountains, praying that the rocks would fall on them and kill them so that they wouldn't have to come face to face with the holy God. We also looked at the fact that in heaven, ever since there was a heaven, every illustration or every depiction, every account that we have of somebody that was called up in the Spirit to see heavenly events, they all testify to the fact that there is constant praise and glory and thanksgiving being offered unto God. We know that they have the seraphim that fly around His throne, crying, holy, holy, holy. It's what they were made to do. And for about the space of half an hour, whether that was literal time or whether that's how long it felt to John, I don't know. But there's a time where God pops this last seal, Jesus opens the last seal on the book, and heaven goes quiet. Maybe for the first time in all of creation. Heaven is silent. The sky's been rolled back. The earth can see into heaven. I don't know if they can hear into heaven too. But imagine for the first time, all creation on earth, all creation in heaven has gone stark silent because this last seal has been opened. Now those seven seals, as we alluded to, that book is a book of judgment. And it was sealed by God seven times. So that judgment would not come to the earth until the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world had made His offering for sin and man had a chance to be redeemed. God on purpose seven times over sealed that book so that what's about ready to happen could not happen until all had been fulfilled according to the Father's will. In fact, John wept when he saw that no one could open the book. One of the elders, in my mind I told you, it'd just be like God to have John in the future talking to John in the past and say, hey, don't worry about it. We've seen this thing already. There's one that can open the book. It's the Lamb. And the Lamb starts opening those seals. And the seventh seal is open, and heaven takes it very serious because heaven gets real quiet. Silent, it said. Not even a church mouse to make any noise. Then we get into these seven trumpets. Lord willing, we're going to get through four of them today. But these trumpets, I told you. Study your Bible. Seven is God's number of completion. How many days did it take God to make the earth six and He rested on the seventh for our example? Then everything that He saw, what did He see? He saw that it was good. Right? Every time that God does something and it is finished, complete, done for the last time, He does it seven times, or there is a seven associated with it. But the seven seals, there's no more seals to be opened. That means Christ has fulfilled and met all of the qualifications to open the seals of that book, and once that book's opened, it can't be shut. Everything has to come to fruition. And then to announce the fact that one was worthy to open the book. To signal that something is about ready to happen, we get seven angels that have trumpets. Now trumpets symbolize, first off, any time that royalty approaches a place or royalty is being presented, right? There's much fanfare. They announce the coming of someone important with music or with the sound of a horn. That has always been the case. 
Horns also have been used to communicate on battlefields. All uh, far back as we can record. There have been calls and cries and shouts that would symbolize certain things to those armies or those peoples fighting because you can't talk across a whole field, but you can sound a trumpet. We all know the sound of charge at baseball games. Why? Because they used to use that in cavalry. When you hear the trumpet sound, charge. Right? Trumpets are also a sign of change. Whenever a trumpet sounds, something's getting ready to begin. Right? Think of the Kentucky Derby. They've got the call to the gate. What's that mean? Everything before this, that's over. It's time for the main event. The trumpet sounded the important things about ready to, to happen. But it's by no accident that God chose to use trumpets. But all of these things are to signal, in truth, that Christ is coming back. It's to signal that all the things that he said would happen have happened. But also, trumpets can be used to issue a challenge. If you were an army that showed up to a city and you wanted to pick a fight, you'd send a whole bunch of trumpets to sound on the outside of the wall to get their attention. Right? It was the old school version of taunting somebody. I walked up to your front door and now I'm making a whole bunch of noise outside. Well, what's Jesus doing? Well, with these trumpets, what he's doing is saying, the Antichrist, the one who said that he was all-powerful, he's not all-powerful. He said, I just opened a book and upset his whole apple cart. Every time he opened one of those seals, it did something to prove that the Antichrist wasn't who he said he was. And now these trumpets are going, he says, if you want to fight, come and fight. He's already numbered his 144,000 chosen. He's already taken all of those when the seals were opened, all those that were martyred because they would not sign up with the Antichrist, he's taking them on home to glory. We've seen all that already. They've been given white robes, and they were given palm leaves. Why were they given palm leaves? Because just like when he rode into Jerusalem on a colt, what did they do? They threw palm leaves down and cried, Hosanna, the king's coming. Right? Hail is a rival. Well, why were they given white robes and palm leaves? Because their taking or being received into heaven was a sign that the king was about ready to walk on into his home. And now these trumpets are saying, all right, ain't it Christ? If you're as big and bad, if you really are the son of perdition, right, let's hash it out. You wanted this, let's go. Well, it says in verse number 6, we talked about the angel throwing down fire from heaven that earthquake and the voices and the rumble it shook the very foundations of the earth after it had just gone quiet then verse number six and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound the trumpets were already ready but the angels prepared themselves well they, they took a big old breath God gave them the job to sound these trumpets and they're going to sound them the best that they can it says, the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. Then they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Does not the Bible say that God's ways change not? Many of these things you'll find that there's a comparison all the way back to when God sent Moses down to lead his people out of Egypt. All the plagues that were visited upon Egypt, each one of them attacked a specific deity of the Egyptian pantheon. It was to prove that their graven images and their idols had no power, but the God of the Israelites did. Well, here God, because He is God and can do whatever He wants, He uses something similar to one of those plagues. He sends hail down from heaven, and it says, and fire. Well, you give me one situation where there can be both fire and frozen water at the same time, right? You've got to change the laws of physics a little bit. You've got to get in there and mess with the laws of thermodynamics because hot and cold don't go together. 
but yet you have both extremes. You have ice and fire. You know the thing about ice and fire? Both destroy. The first time God destroyed the earth, He did it with water, with the floods. He broke up the waters, caused them to flood the very highest point of the earth. All land was covered. That was judgment for sin. Judgment hadn't happened yet. God has not issued judgment yet. God right now, for lack of a better term, He's walking to the ring at a boxing event. Jesus is walking in, and God's using these seven trumpets to show who Jesus really is. He says, this isn't just some nobody. This isn't a carpenter. This isn't the one that you thought that there was nothing comely about him. This isn't the one that was meek and lowly. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. He says, my son, without him was nothing created. Go read John 1. He says, he was there in the beginning. In fact, if you study your Bible, him being the Word, capital W, I really believe that the Son did the will of the Father, not just when he was on earth, but always. I believe God wanted light, and so the Son said, let there be light, because it was the will of the Father. You say, show me chapter and verse on that. I can't, that's just what I believe. But I can see God saying, he's the one that made water. He's the one that made dirt. He's the one that put the seeds into the trees so that they'd have their own seeds within them and they could continue to grow. He says his eyes are as what? Flaming fire. The Bible tells us twice, Old and New Testament, our God is a consuming fire. We're used to seeing fire, but God doesn't deal with ice too often. Ice is very rare and snow very rare in your Bible. But it's always a sign of great struggle or great hardness. One of David's mighty men of valor, one of the examples of snow in the Bible where it's not being referred to your sins being taken away. That's a lot of times where you're going to find a reference for snow in the Bible. That we shall be white as snow or clean as snow, spotless, pure white. But see, one of David's mighty men of valor, Benaiah, says that he slew a lion in a pit on a snowy day. The pit was hard enough. There was no escape. But to make it that much worse, there was snow on top of it. And he was fixing to be in a fight for life and death. Well, you saying, Brother Jordan, God could have just used fire to destroy grass. Wildfires are real common. But God wanted them to know this doesn't have anything to do with natural occurrences. This is because of hardness to prove to you that your Antichrist, who for three and a half years had all the answers and brought so-called peace to the world, right? How did he bring peace? He brought it by killing everybody that didn't agree with him. That's not peace. That's called dictatorship. It's called fascism. It's called fanaticism. That's not peace. That is compelled subjugation. Fall in line or die. So when this fire comes to destroy, it says all the grass, and then it says a third part of the trees. When that fire starts to burn, he says this isn't something that just happened out of accident. Because if you give man just one little space, right, to use his logic, he's going to screw it up. It doesn't matter that literally the sky has been rolled back. It doesn't matter that God has opened these seven seals and caused the four horsemen of the apocalypse to already, they've already shown up and blown through. doesn't matter about if there was just one way that they could say, oh no, that, that's just a coincidence that all the grass burned up. Man would say it. So God says, not only am I going to burn it up, when you go to inspect it, there's going to be big, big piles of ice rocks everywhere. It wasn't a natural fire. This is the fire from heaven. This is the fire that came down and took the offering off of Elijah's uh, altar that he had built with the stones and soaked with all the water. 
He says, this isn't man's fire, this is God's fire. And it takes exactly what God wants and leaves everything else. But he takes a third of the trees and all of the grass. I want you to think about the implications of that. The population of earth's already been whittled down a whole lot by now. But without any grass, how long do you think a cow is going to survive? Without any grass, how long do you think you're going to have livestock? Without any grass, you can't even go out and make hay to go out and compost and get fertilizer. But imagine how much... Di I know that we all live in concrete jungles most of the time now. But if grass just disappeared, your life would be very different in about three to four days. Then on top of that, he says, I'm taking a third of the trees. Now why would he take a third of the trees? He just took all the grass. Why wouldn't he take all the trees? Well, there's some people that need them trees. These 144,000 running through the wilderness, God's still providing for them. God's still making a way that they have all of their needs met as they're on the run from the Antichrist. He may just use some of them trees. It's real hard to hide if there's no cover anywhere. God left them a refuge underneath of those trees by right, symbolizing, essentially, the tree of life. The branch that God grafted in for us, what are we a part of? His vine, His tree. What's He destroying? Well, He's separating the wheat from the chaff is what He's doing. The wheat and the tares. What are the tares good for? Only to be cast into the fire and burned. It's a symbol of the fact that He chose to take it but he also has a purpose for the others. But on top of that, why did he take the trees? Trees in your Bible are always a symbol of stability, sturdiness. Now, the psalmist said that I shall be like a tree planted by the waters. Got deep roots. It's strong. Its strength is not seen, it's hidden. This first trumpet sounds and he's attacking the inner strength of all those that oppose him. The things that you can't see. He's getting way deep down into those roots. In fact, he's going to pluck them up by the root, twice dead. Right? He's not just going to cast them into hell. There's the lake of fire, which is the second death. He's attacking those core values. These are the men that were running the world not too long ago. But yet now they're hiding in caves, fearing for their life, begging for rocks to crush them so that they don't have to come face to face with God. He's attacking those deep roots that they had. The things that they were clinging to the most. The Lord just doesn't want to defeat them. The Lord wants to embarrass them. He's got to get them desperate. How desperate? So desperate that everybody links up arm in arm and ends up in the valley of Megiddo. You got to be real desperate for everybody to say, let's go all in on one attack. Well, it says, and the second angel sounded, and as, it, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And a third part of the sea became blood, and a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life, died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. I don't know what this great flaming mountain is. I believe it's a big old rock. And I believe it was hot. John's using the best that he's got to explain to us what he saw. I don't know what it's going to look like. But I know God's throwing something real hot and real big into the ocean. What is it? I don't know what it is. But what he's doing is symbolizing that even those things that you can't see, right? The book of Job talks about Leviathan. That thing deep in the waters of the earth that 
even though it's got a tail like a cedar tree. Even though it's the most ferocious and nasty thing that man could ever dream up. Right? It's still nothing compared to the power of God. It still has to do what it is that God says it should and should not do. They say that we've only explored about 10% at best of what's really out there in the oceans. Our world's made up of 75% water. A lot of it frozen in Antarctica and the North Pole. There are things in the ocean that man can't even dream of. I truly believe that. And God's going to reach down in there and kill a third of those living things and they're going to rise to the surface and they're going to float up to the coastlines and they're going to say, we thought we had it all figured out. And there's things that we still don't understand. There's the humbling aspect of it. There's also, again, the demonstration of His power. What did God do in Egypt? He turned a third of the water into blood. But it says that the third that were in the sea had life, died. doesn't say that they were eviscerated. It just says that they died. But by the time something that's all the way out there in the waters gets to shore after it's been dead that long, it's not fit to eat anymore. He's already taken all the grass away. They're looking for food. God says you can't even run to the waters. Third of them dead in an instant. All the fish and marine wildlife. Gone. It says a third of the ships. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. When some ran to the mountains, some got, they said, we don't want to be on land no more. We're going to get onto these boats. Maybe someone had loaded up a supply ship and was coming to bring reserves to the Antichrist and his group. And all of a sudden that mountain hits and the ships are gone. God says there's no escape. Right? He's like the Navy SEALs. That's what SEAL stands for. Sea, air, and land. It doesn't matter where you go, there's no hiding from the power of God. Jonah figured that out a long time ago. God put him in the belly of a great fish. And Jonah thought he was in hell for three days and three nights. He said, God's down in Tarshish. God's out on the ocean. God's in the belly of that fish. You can't get away from him. But just as the Antichrist and everybody else said, well, we're going to go from an agricultural-based economy, we're going to become a marine economy, and we're going to get our living from the sea, God throws a giant mountain that was on fire into the water and upsets that apple cart. Then, just to put icing on the cake, he takes away the ships. Because even then, they're like, well, we can take some of the fish, and we can, we can do it like they do down in the south or some of these fancy restaurants where you year round that aren't in season all year round they have fisheries or hatcheries what's that it's a fish farm and God says it doesn't matter where you put the fish if I don't want you to have the fish you're not going to have the fish again he's increasing their desperation levels he's challenging their deep rooted beliefs that the antichrist has all the answers and as we've said, the first three and a half years are going to be peaceful for the followers of the Antichrist. Everything's going to follow right in line like that prophet that came before him said it would. And then right before, everybody's about ready to say, all right, this, this is the true Christ. What happens? Jesus says, do you think so? Let's see about that. He hadn't even showed up yet. This is just his announcement. Yeah, like coming all the way from glory with an undefeated record. Right? Here's just a few of the things that he can do. Right? Jesus hadn't even lifted his hand yet. Who threw the fire and the censer down to earth? An angel. Right? Who sounded the first trumpet? An angel. Who sounded the second one? An angel. 
and it says that a mountain was cast into the sea. God may not have even lifted a finger to do it. He may have just looked at the mountain and said, Hey, into the water. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? He's not even flexed yet. In fact, you study it all the way out, he doesn't even need to raise a hand to defeat all the armies that are gathered against Israel. So as a sharp two-edged sword proceeds out of his mouth, what's he got to do? He just has to look at him and say, be gone. But it says, the second angel, angel sounded, cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. Now you can believe what you want to believe. But again, when God does something, there's no mistaking that God did it. When God turned all the water in Egypt into blood for a time, it wasn't just the Nile that he turned into blood, like, you know, the Charlton Heston movie, where you can see that. That was easy to do for movie magic. It was all the water that they had already had in their water pots. It was all the water that rained and came down from heaven. It was all blood. Well, God doesn't want them to die right now. That's what the B Battle of Armageddon's for. He wants there to be a constant reminder that God's coming. And He's announcing His return with seven trumpets. Well, this second trumpet, it says a third of the water. Not all the water. There's still some water. You can take salt water and still turn it into drinking water. You just got to distill it. Okay, and nowadays they use it to water the grasses down there in Florida and everywhere else. They use reverse osmosis. They're going to have technology and things that they can use. But, a third of the water. You go out to the ocean, I believe if you take a cup and take a cup out of the ocean, a third of the water that you end up with in your cup is blood. If a wave hits you, a third of it is blood. Not just a third of it localized in one spot everywhere, one third. But how can he do that? He's God. But maybe they're out there trying to fish for the two-thirds of the remaining fish. Every time they bring up a bucket, a third of it's blood. That's a reminder that it's coming. They don't know when. And they don't know how long they're going to have to suffer like this, but every time they go and they grab water out of the sea, a third of its blood is a reminder that God did this. And the Antichrist can't undo it. Well, then it says in verse number 10, a third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the foundations or the fountains of water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Again, another parallel, only in reverse, from what God did with Israel in the wilderness. They came to the place that they named Mara, because Mara means bitter. Because the waters there were unfit for drinking. Well, they were salty. Salt water kills you. In fact, if you are ever marooned on a raft and that's all you've got, hold out as long as you can before you start drinking salt water because salt water is going to kill you quicker than not having water. You say, Brother Jordan, that's rather cynical. No, that's just science. That's the way God made your body. Salt is not good in great amounts for you. In salt water, your body cannot process it. Salt can preserve, but salt can also kill. There's blessing and cursing and everything. But it says here that a, a star. Now you believe what you won't believe. God knows that the name of every single one of them. He calls them all by name. And he's got one that a long time ago he named bitterness. And when this trumpet sounds, he's going to look at it, and that star is going to fall from where he hung it. And it's going to come down, and it's going to smite a third of the rivers. 
and the fountains of life. What's that mean? All the wells, all the rivers, the river water, the great lakes, the fresh water we're talking about now. Now, they say that the Dead Sea has so much salt in it that it's impossible for you to drown in it. Well, that's the kind of water that a third of the rivers and a third of the lakes and a third of the ground wells and everything else. It's going to become so salty that without it, it's not like, hmm, this tastes like it has a little salt in it. No, it's going to be mostly salt with a little bit of water. It becomes wormwood, it says. It's the definition, the embodiment of bitterness. And you know how desperate people are at this point? Some of them are still willing to try it to see how it turns out. Because it says, right, many, many men died of the water. How desperate were they that they knew it was bitter and they chose to still drink it anyway, hoping that there was a way that it wouldn't kill them. Sounds like desperation to me. But it also sounds like a great illustration for sin. Adam knew it was wrong. Eve knew it was wrong. They believed God that surely they would die until they were, well, until Eve was beguiled by Satan. I still believe that Adam knew and still believed that God said that they would die and he took it anyway. Lord, this is bitter water, but I'm going to drink it anyway and hope that it doesn't kill me. I know it's going to, but I'm just hoping maybe it's an extra day. Maybe it's just a few hours, a few minutes, but I don't want to die. But even though this is poison, I'm going to take it anyway. Hoping that God is wrong. And God's never wrong. They died spiritually. And what's been the result? Well, this is the final chapters of man's rule and reign on the earth. There's a brief time where Satan's loosed after the millennial reign. But even then, man's not in charge. These are the sunsets of man's reign, if you will, upon the earth. This is all that man's logic and reasoning brought about. And yet the best of the best, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth, they're drinking salt water, knowing it's going to kill them, but hoping that it doesn't. They're desperate. It's also a symbol of the fact that by this point, they've gone from fearful when they were hiding in the caves. Then they were trying to come up with plans. All right, how are we going to recover from this? But God takes away all the grass and all the livestock and everything that eats grass. Takes away the trees. He's taken away the ocean and the fish from them and their ships. And right as they were thinking, well, fine, we don't need to go out into the salt waters. There's plenty of fish inland. God turns a third of it into salt water. Well, you know what? Maybe it's not the river. There's still a whole bunch of lakes. Well, a third of them turned into salt. But how about the well water? So, anything that's water on land, a third of it turned into salt. And at this point, they're so bitter, I believe some of them may have drank it as a form of suicide. I don't know, but I mean, they're desperate at this point. They're running out of answers and they're running out of ways to appease the people. And it says, And the fourth angel sounded in verse number 12. And a third part of the sun was smit. And the third part of the moon. And a third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of them. And the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Just when they think it can't get any worse, God turns a third of the light off. 
It says that a third part of the day, the sun don't shine no more. It says a third part of the night, it's completely dark. He smote a third of the moon and a third of the stars. I believe that they're all still there. I just believe that God cut out a spot and said, no light. I believe that for the first time since creation, God undoes one of His works of creation in these verses. God said, let there be light without restriction. Let there be light. And He chose to use the sun to rule over the day in the sky and the moon to rule over the night in the sky. And He made the stars to also shine light. And for the first time since God said, let there, He says, let there not be. Not all of it. He doesn't take all of it away. He takes a third of it. And I believe with it being God, I believe it might change every day. What time it gets dark for that span. And why do you say that, Brother Jordan? Because again, we've got people trying to explain things away. And if it happened from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock every day, they'd say, well, there was a great astronomical event that caused all this to happen, and now there's something in the sky that blocks things out at the same time every day. But if it happens at 2 o'clock today, and it happens at 9 a.m. tomorrow, that's harder to explain. Because again, these are all to prove that God did it, not anybody else. They say that we get our warmth from the light. That it is the light of the sun that actually heats the earth. Can you imagine if God turned off the heat for a third part of the day and a third part of the night? And then cuts it right back on. I don't know about you, I got a hard problem adjusting to different temperature zones. When I get onto a plane here next month when Dad and I are headed down to a camp meeting, it's going to be cold up here and it's going to be not cold down in Florida. It's going to feel like it's 90 to me even though it's only going to be about 60, 65, 70. Right? And then when I get back, it's going to feel like I hit the ice age again. He's taking away their very comfort. There's a comfort in looking up into the sky at night knowing that where God hung them, they're still there. It's a testament of the fact that God put it there and God kept it there. It's a comfort to look up and to know that depending on which phase of the moon it is, it's either going to get bigger or it's going to get smaller, but it's coming back because that's where God put it in orbit. God's never caused the sun to come up in the west and set in the east. There's a rhythm and a pattern, and everything stays in order because that's the will of God. But it doesn't matter where you look a third part of the night. There'll be no stars. There'll be no moon. Because God said there's no light during that time. And a third part of the day, doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter how outside you get, it's not going to be like a solar eclipse where it's still kind of sunny. Oh no, outer darkness is what I believe. You can't even get a right, sunset to give you the warning, just lights go out. And then a third part of the day later, Lights come back on. What are you saying, Brother Joe? I'm saying he's taking away their comfort, their reliable things. For as far back as man can go, man's been living by the sun coming up, the sun coming down. The moon going up and the moon coming down. And them being stable in the way that they do it. And God says, you can't even live off of the same time schedule anymore. In fact, the things on your wrist, these watches that we wear nowadays, you know why they have the numbers on them that they do and they move in there? Because it's defined by how the sun goes, moves across the sky. In other words, how the earth moves around the sun. They got it down to the seconds. 
And they know exactly how long it takes earth to go around the sun once a year. And that's how they divvied up a calendar. Well, God had one long before that, and it's still working just fine for the Jews today. But man has always judged time and judged length by what? The sun and the stars. Can you imagine being out a boat in the middle of the ocean in a third part of the night? There's nothing for you to have your bearings. You're just floating on the water. No sense of where you are. No sense of where you're going to be headed. And then all of a sudden everything comes back and you realize you're lost. You headed the wrong direction. Can you imagine driving a car and then all of a sudden there's no light? Talking about middle of the day. And then all of a sudden pitch black in front of you. Your headlights won't even have time to come on if they're automatic. That takes a second. And for a second, you've got the panic attack, mild heart attack, of what in the world just happened. And it's going to happen every day. Not regularly. At the same time, it's going to happen so that God steals what? Their comfort, their self-assurance, that everything will be okay eventually. They can't even figure out when the sun's going to shine anymore. And then after all of that, an angel comes flying overhead. And John hears them say, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet the sound. He says, Y'all think that's bad. The next three are a whole lot worse. We're a little over halfway through these trumpets, and what's God done? God's taken every chance that these people have of putting a plan together on how they're going to make it and he's throwing it out the window. In other words, to use the illustration again, if Jesus was walking to the boxing ring, he's taken away every game plan that that other fighter could even hope to have. That guy can't even stand up on his own now. And yet we're still not done. In four trumpets, it's very apparent that Jesus was the one that created everything and he has all power over that creation. In four trumpets, it's very clear that nobody has the power to undo what God has done. They're going to try everything that they can. I can see them seeing, sending satellites up into orbit, hoping that there's just something blocking the sun and they can redirect it with mirrors to give them light during the day or during the night. And what are they going to find out there? Darkness. What are they going to find if they take a plane trip to a different part of the world that a third part of the day it's darkness? Well, what if we go out into the middle of the ocean? Darkness. Day and night. I find it no coincidence that this chapter starts with silence and then ends with darkness. God's given them the exact opposite of what they're going to have for all of eternity. In the beginning, he gives them silence. We know that hell is a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. We know that that's as quiet as they will ever hear it. Everything from there, from that moment of silence until the Lord comes back, all they're going to hear is chaos and panic and frantic. And then, it gives them darkness. They, there's still sounds, there's still things going on. But I've said, it drives people insane to be locked into rooms with darkness for extended, or with silence for extended periods of time. The same is true with darkness. Your brain will start inventing things for you to see, hallucinations, because it needs input through your eyes. What's God doing? He's turning the lights off long enough just to scare them and then popping it right back on. He's given their flesh just long enough to feel the fear of the Lord and then he turns the lights back on to prove to them that they don't have all the power that they thought that they really had. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.